About a year ago, I came across a sermon entitled The Great Escape by Pastor Sarah Jakes Roberts. There is a section in that sermon of her that she was preaching that caught me and it caught me in a myriad of ways. But one way in particular was the flash of my entire life based on the portion of her sermon that she was in. This particular portion of her sermon caught me so much so that I had to actually go back, type it out, put it on a poster and add my face to it so that I would always have a visual reminder of just what living in exile has done for me. And while living in exile has been difficult, so to speak, it has always been for my purpose. Here is the excerpt. Embracing the exile. Exiled people have powerful potential. Exiled people feel rejected, like they don't fit in, like nobody understands them. God didn't allow anyone to embrace me because if I would have been embraced by certain groups, I would not have been hungry for him. Because I became hungry for him, my purpose and my power were set on fire. There is power in being an exiled person. No, I never fit in, but had they embraced me, I would have stopped growing. But because I kept growing, I had to learn to love myself and I had to learn to figure out what was special about me because no one else saw it. I recognize now that there is something on the inside of me that they would have contaminated with their opinions, so God protected me. I thought I was being abused and rejected, and I was, but I didn't realize it was also protection. I felt exiled, but that exile was indeed protection. It wasn't punishment. I wasn't supposed to be the popular one. I wasn't supposed to be the one that everyone else understood. I was exiled, but exile worked out in my favor. Exile taught me that I could fight for myself. Exile taught me that I have ideas and creativity that only I could manifest. Exile worked out in my favor because I have a relationship with God that isn't just religion. It isn't just church. I know how to call on the name of Jesus by myself. I don't have a choir, a worship team. All I have is my brokenness and my loneliness and the belief that if I call on the name of Jesus, that if I do something and open my mouth in prayer, that he will be with me. I was indeed exiled, but I was brought in closer to Jesus. I was exiled from the world, but I was brought in closer to the Lord. My exile actually began before I was born. My exile began during my conception. I was conceived in rape to a 13-year-old girl who was being raped by her biological father. That being said, the stigma that comes with that, with her being young, with her being raped by her biological father, placed a stigma on me as well. It was a stigma that I lived with for 13 years until I realized why that stigma was over my head and what actually that truth meant for me. Being born to a young mother is one thing. Being born to a mother out of rape and incestuous rape and into a family where molestation and child abuse is a m runs amok, it leads to a pretty difficult life. Um, my early years, I remember the, the verbal abuse. I remember the physical abuse. I remember young aunts and uncles and my mother being as young as she was they were never really parents to their children. They were always partying, they were always clubbing. Children were pretty much left to themselves or left with our grandmother. It's funny because my grandmother was definitely in love with God. She definitely had a relationship with God that none of us really understood. Even as young as I was, two, three, four, five years old, I can remember always wondering she talks about this God all the time, and he is supposed to be so perfect. We go to church and all these people praise and worship this God that I've never seen. We just only hear about him. But if he's so perfect, why is my life so toxic? Why am I going through so much abuse? Why are so many things going on around me 
that are unkind, unfair, unfriendly? Why is it so volatile in my life? What have I done to this God that, make, that would make him hate me? What has the child done that, would allow, that this God would allow me to endure so much abuse and so much toxicity? And because of that, I began to question and I began to doubt this God was indeed real. I lived with my mother here in Michigan until about nine years old, nine, 10 years old. And in that time, the child abuse was extensive. Um, she would beat me for anything. I was, she was leaving me at home with my younger siblings who were really young at the time. So a nine-year-old taking care of smaller kids, you're going to come home to your house a mess. <laughs> Kids are not going to be fed properly. Laundry is not going to be done. The food is going to be unkempt, uncooked, whatever. Whatever you would think that a nine, a five, and a two to three year old would do in a house unsupervised, it happened. And that would warrant beatings because I wasn't the perfect parent. I couldn't understand why as big as my family was, nobody ever bothered to help me. It's like it was a norm in my family for me to get cussed out, screamed at, yelled at, I got called bitch and I got called slut and I got called all these derogatory things, more so than I got called my own name. And it just made no sense to me why it was so normal. And even at that young age, as weird as it was, I knew that it was wrong. I knew that it wasn't normal. I didn't know what normal was, but I knew that that wasn't it. Looking back on it now, it was only the grace of God. And I truly believe that it was indeed God planting seeds in my mind, seeds of doubt. Because as much abuse as I endured and lived around, it should have been normal to me. Because again, I didn't know anything else. As big as my family is, my aunts and uncles were my babysitters. And that was also their norm. So we didn't go outside of the family to see a different normal. And of course, going to school, you don't see how kids, your classmates live at home. And because you don't typically see their parents, you automatically assume this is what they're going through too, but you never discuss it. Why wouldn't we think that? Because looking back on it, if it wasn't normal and it's not, why did nobody step in? It was toxic. Um, my mother, because she was very young and because of what happened to her, she she didn't do drugs, she didn't do alcohol. Her drug or her alcohol of choice was men. She always ran to older men, so she was always in a different relationship, always with a different man. And even in that, I would always say to myself, she's always putting men before us. I don't wanna ever put men before my kids if I ever have kids. I don't want kids, but if I ever have kids, I definitely don't wanna repeat this mistake. And when the abuse got worse and worse because she met a drug dealer. Actually, she met and married the biggest drug dealer in Michigan at the time. And it turned from her abusing me physically to me having to watch her endure physical abuse and emotional abuse. And it almost seemed like she would then beat me without me doing anything wrong just because she couldn't beat him. I remember probably 10 or 11 years old, I'd finally, we'd finally moved into a house where I had my own bedroom. And I was so happy because I'd never had my own bedroom and it actually felt like life was about to get better right before I hit middle school. But it didn't get better. It got worse really quick. I remember laying in my bed upstairs asleep and I started hearing her scream and cry and yell. And she was nine months pregnant, so I'm thinking, is she about to have the baby? Is she in labor? She wasn't in labor. He was beating, her, bo her boyfriend was beating her so bad that she tried to get away from him and her getting away from him meant that she ran upstairs into my bedroom. And she sat on my bed thinking that he wouldn't continue to beat her if I was near. He continued to beat her. I laid there frozen while she was being beat. I took a couple of the licks and I just cried, cried, cried and I was, so terrified that I just could not move. And I remember laying there thinking, why is she still with this man? Why would she want to be with the man who does this to her? And once I came out of my thought and I started getting the hits myself because she was laying next to me, I remember thinking he is going to kill her. 
But what's ironic is while I was laying there thinking, he is going to kill her, I wasn't sad. And I wasn't sad because my next thought was, if he kills her, I'll get rescued. I'll go to a different family where I won't get cussed at, yelled at, and beat up. He'll go to prison, she'll be dead, and I'll be rescued. That didn't happen because after he beat her, um, my uncle found out about the beating and my uncle actually came to our house the next day with a gun to kill him. And he was five minutes too late because the man had just left. Um, my family ended up calling CPS at that point. They called CPS to report the child abuse, the neglect and the domestic violence. I'm not sure why, but when CPS came to my school to interview me, I lied. And it makes no sense because I wanted to be rescued, but I froze up and I lied to them about the abuse. And when my mother found out about them coming to my school, I went to school the next day thinking that it was okay because she didn't react. She just said, go to your room. Okay. I'm thinking, oof, dodge that bullet. I'm not going to get a beating. Okay. But I came home from school the next day and the house was packed up. And I thought, where are we going? We're going to Mississippi. Who's in Mississippi and why are we going to Mississippi? Her boyfriend came into the living room and his words to me were, we're going to Mississippi where people mind their own business. You're not gonna have anybody to tell about the beatings. You're not gonna have anybody to tell about anything. I'm taking you to where I'm from. White folks mind their own business and it's just gonna be what it is. My world was crushed because even though my family has its issues and even though my family was toxic, it was my family. I knew that there were certain family members that I could run to when I needed someone to talk to. Even though they would send me right back home, for a minute I would have a reprieve. But to take me to the other side of the country and to a town, town that I'm not familiar with and, and to people that I don't know and I had no reason to, to not believe him, I thought, I'm never gonna escape this. He's gonna end up killing her or me or she's going to kill me because her beatings have gotten that severe. And I remember the long trip to Mississippi. I had never really talked to God, but I remember having a conversation with him on the way there going, if you are indeed who my grandmother says you are, you have a lot of explaining to do. My life doesn't make any sense. My grandmother sings about you all the time. She's at church multiple times a week. All she talks about is God this, God this, God that but my life is so toxic, my family is so toxic. And now my life is about to get worse. If you are indeed who you say you are, I need for you to begin to show your face because right now I hate you. I hate the thought of you, I hate everything about you because what have I done at such a young age to warrant the kind of treatment that I've been enduring? That was me going further and further into what I deem an exile because I was taken away from my family and I was taken away from any supposed safety net that I thought I had. The beatings continued in Mississippi. The beatings were extremely severe. Not only did the beatings continue, me being left at home to take care of my siblings continued, but me also not having a safe space was exacerbated because the house that we had just moved from in Michigan, I had finally had my own bedroom. I finally had my own piece of heaven and a way for me to escape from everything, a way for me to get, imagine that I was somewhere else. I could go into my room, close my door, and it would just be me up there because my bedroom was upstairs and I could imagine any reality that I wanted and it was my area. Moving to Mississippi with this man, I didn't have a bedroom. I had a room that I slept in and I was always in constant terror around this man, always in constant terror around my mother because whenever those two were together, it was a pretty good possibility that she would get a beating or I would get a beating or a combination of the both, regardless of what was going on, just because that was who he was. I hated the idea of going to Mississippi, but Mississippi actually saved my life looking back. As difficult as the transition was, that is where my life was saved. Um, I was 13 years old when my mother sat me down to explain to me who my birth father was. When she explained to me who my birth father was, a couple of things happened. 
I began to reflect. I began to reflect back over the course of my life, my short life at that point. And I remember always asking about who my father was and never getting an answer. I remember asking relatives who my father was and getting smirks and getting snares, never getting an answer. I remember my brother going off with his father, my sister going off with her father, but nobody ever really wanting to discuss who my father was. But then I would also remember comments that friends would make, joking about, that's why you're, you and your mother have the same father. What do you mean? And then they would laugh it off and tell me that they were playing. And then I would reflect onto my father's wife. This lady hated me. How does a grown woman hate a three or four or five year old child? She never called me by my name. I was always that girl. So my mother was sitting here telling me this story about how she was raped by her biological father and that is my father and we have to go take a DNA test to prove it. And all while she's telling me this, all this stuff is flashing through my mind. And I'm going, wow. I have been the family secret my entire life. Everybody around me has known this truth and they kept it from me. And clearly they joked about it because my, some of my friends have known and they shouldn't have known. Why would my friends know the secret about me and I don't know? And I'm also thinking to myself, there goes my fantasy. I used to do what I call sleepscaping. And to me, sleepscaping is falling asleep, imagining a different life, imagining a healthier life, a safer life. Because I never knew who my biological father was, I had the freedom and the liberty to always imagine he was somebody else. And he was always some star off of TV that I admired. And I would always imagine one day being rescued and being taken to this, living this elaborate, healthy life where I no longer had to worry about being abused. I no longer had to worry about not having my knees met. I no longer had to worry about any of the things that I had dealt with up to that point. When she told me who my biological father was, she shattered that reality and she made me grow up in a way that I did not want to grow up in. Now that I know who my biological father is, there's no way he's coming to rescue me because this man is a pedophile. So I'm the child of a pedophile. So not only am I born to a 13 year old mother who beats the crap out of me on a regular basis and clearly hates my guts because that's how she acts toward me, but I'm also the child of a pedophile. And there is a God in heaven is what I would always think. This makes no sense. This is just compounding the misery of my life. What is it about me that this God that everybody seems to love, what is it about me that makes him hate me so much? What is the point of my life? The kids at school, all they do is judge me. I'm the light skinned, proper talking, good hair having girl from Michigan. The kids don't like me. My family doesn't like me, clearly because they're leaving me here with my mother who they know was abusing me. And by this point, I've called my grandmother multiple times on the trips where my mother and her husband were taken to Michigan or wherever they were going and leaving me home alone. I would sneak and make the collect call, praying that before the phone bill came in, that my grandmother would rescue me. I would call up here, I would complain and I would cry about the abuse. Money would be sent here and then it would go quiet and everything would start over again. So not too long after I found out who my biological father was, I was left home yet again with my siblings and I thought I'm done. There is no point in this. My life is never gonna get any better now. That man is my biological father. He's not gonna rescue me. My family is not gonna rescue me. I only have two Caucasian teachers in the school that I go to and they are the only two that would ever possibly help me because nobody black down here will touch this man because they're afraid of him. But he said that they mind their own business so they're not gonna help me. I'm just gonna end it all. Two o'clock in the morning, I remember going into the bathroom, swallowing half a bottle of pills. And it was a bottle of 500 milligram Tylenol. As many pills as I swallowed, as young as I was and as small as I was, they should have killed me. And I was home alone with two kids who were sleeping. I swallowed the pills. And probably 10 to 15 minutes after swallowing them, I began to regurgitate violently, vomiting them up. Just coming up, coming up, coming up. And I cried because it was coming up. I didn't want it to come up. 
And I remember screaming, no, no, no. Why is this not working? Why is this not working? And it was the first time in my life that I've ever heard what I now know is God's voice. And he said to me in that moment, you have a life yet to live. I do not hate you. I am not punishing you. I love you. I am going to use you in a mighty way. Get through it, live through it, and trust me, I'm here. I've always been here. And I'm listening to him say this to me, and I'm thinking, this must be this God that my grandmother is always talking about, but I hate you. I don't want to know you. You can't tell me that you love me and that you have something for me to do if this is what you're allowing me to go through. If you love me, let me die. He wouldn't let me die. Not too long after that, um, we traveled to St. Louis, Missouri, as a matter of fact. I had to take a blood test to prove that this man was indeed my biological father. And I remember seeing his wife, who I thought was my grandmother, my step-grandmother, grandmother, whatever the case may be. And she just had this disgusting look on her face and it took me back years before to when I was two, three, four, we were living with them. And I thought, why does this lady hate me so much? But now it's making sense. You hate me because you knew what your husband was doing to his daughter. What the hell is wrong with you that you would allow this? You have children, you have a daughter. And I'm sitting there going, this makes no sense. This makes no sense. She still hates me. What did I do? I took the blood test. We left Missouri. We came back to Michigan. And I found out the point of the blood test wasn't because I needed to know the truth. The point of the blood test was because he was sick. And my mother found out that she could get a check because this is his child. And he's worked at General Motors his entire life. So if we prove her paternity, we can get a disability check. I found out that that was the reason and it just disgusted me even more. You have shattered every escape of mine mentally over a check. Looking back on it now, I needed to know who my father was because I needed to begin to face my reality. But at that young age, it was not something that I was willing to stomach. It was too much coming at me too soon. I'm not sure what led to it, but that check caused a lot of tension really, really quick because a lot of money initially came with that check. And I remember the cussing and the fussing and the screaming yet again. And I remember my mother getting tired of being beat by this man. And she had found his arsenal. She had found where he hid his guns. And I remember watching him beat the crap out of her. Just, I was so over it. She found one of his guns and she almost killed him with that gun that day. But he took it from her right before she could pull the trigger. And he beat her with it and he tossed the gun. While he was beating her, my, mo my mindset went to, where'd that gun go? Because at, I know his ammo. He's gonna be beat the crap out of her. She's gonna end up in her room. I'm gonna be babysitting the kids. And he's gonna be gone probably till tomorrow. So if I can figure out where that gun went, I can probably kill one or both of them and, get my, and, escape, and free myself from this misery. But my luck, he didn't leave. Why would he not leave this time? Why is he still here? The next morning, my brother and I were arguing because he wanted me to iron him a new set of clothes. I had to iron everybody's school clothes the day before. He didn't want to wear what I had ironed. So we were arguing, and my mother's husband heard that argument. And I'm not sure what he told her, but what she came to the bathroom to say to me was, I'm sick and tired of your BS. You are always acting out. You always giving me a hard time. Just do what the hell I told you to do. And while she's cussing me out, he's cussing her out because he's sick of all of us. And because she was getting angrier and angrier, and I could, tell, I could tell that she was scared of him, she began to beat me worse than she had ever beat me before. She beat me so bad that day that I could not sit out on a school bus. That's a problem because in Mississippi, where we lived, you, you live so far in the country that your school bus picks you up in front of your house because the houses are that far apart. And the school was a, a good 45 minute bus ride. So that entire 45 minute bus ride, the bus driver was yelling at me because I could not sit down. And I could not tell him why, because we couldn't talk. 
in Mississippi, it's sit down, shut up. You don't move, you don't breathe loud, you don't say a word while this bus is in motion. And if you do, we're calling your parents. And if he would have called my mother, it would have been a worse beating because who you don't get in trouble at school. So I am in, in horrid pain, this entire 45 minute bus ride to school. And I was desperate. I ended up going to my geometry class, a Caucasian teacher, one of the two Caucasian teachers in the building. And I happened to have both of them assigned to me this year. And I remember sitting down in her seat and then hopping back up because again, the pain was just unbearable. And she looked at me and I looked at her and our eyes locked and I'm not sure what it was. Now I know it was that nonverbal communication, but something in her eyes said, whatever is wrong, please tell me. And I couldn't verbalize what was going on. So I sat in that chair at an angle and I just wrote a letter. And because I did not want to face her rejection, I did not want to face her making excuses for it. I held on to that letter. And then when she went to the office, I remember putting that letter on her desk. When she came back in, she gave us a test and she sat down. And when I saw her walking out of the classroom in tears, I thought, she's going to help me. She didn't go to the principal. She didn't go to another black teacher. She went to the other Caucasian teacher. And the, between the two of them, the two people who my stepfather had said would mind their own business and would not give a damn about what was going on with me, between the two of them, they called CPS. And this time, I did not lie. CPS came to the school. They ended up taking pictures of my body. And what's ironic is, I wasn't crying, I was relieved, but they were in tears. And I thought, why are they crying? It didn't happen to them. Looking back on it now, it was the evidence of what I had been living with. Because living in Mississippi, I had been there, we'd been there a little more than a year, probably two years at that point but everybody thought we were rich because he was a drug dealer and he had money. Everybody thought we were status. Everybody thought that my life was perfect because I would come to school in minks and I would come to school with money. They didn't realize that those were bribes. That was hush money. That was keep our business in our house. Here you go. That's what that was. So they were jealous of me and they didn't realize the hell that I was enduring. The smile, was infectious. The popularity was infectious. I was highly intelligent because school was my reprieve. School was where I escaped. I couldn't emotionally escape at night. I couldn't go to sleep and sleepscape. School was the only thing that I could control. So I made sure that when I was at school, I was at school. My goal was always, if you can't control anything around you, you can control your education. So go to school, get good grades, do what you're supposed to be doing. So I never talked about what was going on at home because I didn't want the gossip to get back to them and the beatings to get worse. So to hear these adults crying, I'm thinking to myself, should I have told them before? Would they have actually listened? Did it have to get this bad? Hindsight is always 2020, but I thank God that those Caucasian teachers who were supposed to mind their own business, they said, no, nah, we're not gonna mind our own business. And I ended up in my first foster placement that day and I felt bad because I left siblings behind, but I knew that I had to get out of there because I knew that had I been able to get to that house and get to that gun eventually, either I would have been dead or one of them would have been dead because I would have found a way to escape. And clearly God knew that that would have occurred because he said enough. And he pulled me out of that environment and, he, and I entered into the foster care system in Mississippi. The first foster placement was difficult. It was almost as toxic as my home life, except I wasn't being beat. Um, my foster mother's daughter was dating a drug dealer. So she was always getting beat. It was always violence. It was always cussing and fussing. But I felt safer because I wasn't the target of the abuse. And I felt safer also because I was finally being called by my name. I wasn't being cursed out. My wounds on my body were healing. And now that people knew what I had been enduring, the kids were no longer jealous of me. They were actually more open to being friends with me. Um, the friends that I had, had a better understanding of what I had been enduring. So it was no longer, that's that girl from Michigan who thinks she's better than everybody. 
That's that, oh, she got issues just like we do, girl. Yes, I have issues just like everybody else. The good hair, the light complexion, the proper accent, none of that does nothing for me to shield me from the abuse that I've been living with for years. So while you're jealous of me, you don't realize what you've been jealous of. And so even though the home environment that I was living in was toxic, it was a, it was better than what I'd come from. Unfortunately, I remember waking up one day, getting ready for school, and my foster mother on the phone, cussing and fussing and yelling. And I'm thinking, it is too early in the morning. She can't be talking to anybody at DHS because they're not even open yet. And so I'm getting dressed and I'm listening and I hear her cussing about a check. She's mad because she hadn't received her check. And I'm thinking, here we go again with this money. Am I worth nothing more than money to people around me? She is really upset and talk, threatening to get rid of me over a check. I'm just like, whatever, it is what it is. I'm just biding my time. So I'm brushing my teeth and getting dressed. And all of a sudden her daughter comes upstairs and she hands me a trash bag and says, put your stuff in this bag. For what? You're taking me to school, right? Put your stuff in that bag. Okay. I learned quickly not to argue with anybody in the South. Kids don't argue with grown folks. Even though her daughter wasn't an adult adult, she was close enough and I did not argue with her. So I put my stuff in a trash bag going, what in the world is going on? Is she really going to send me back because they forgot to give her her check or her check is late? Sure enough, her daughter drove me to DHS before 8 o'clock in the morning and sat me there on that porch. In Mississippi, where we were at, the DHS offices were in trailers. And it's ironic that I now live in a trailer because I find solace in this one. I hated that one. She sat me on the porch and said, wait here, your social worker will be here in about 15 or 20 minutes. And I thought, you're really leaving me here? I'm just doing what my mama told me to do. And she drove off and she left me there. I was probably 14-ish at the time. And I remember sitting there with my stuff in a trash bag going, you have got to be kidding me. God, you keep asking me to trust you and I'm trusting you, but this is ridiculous. This lady really did just put me out of her house because my social worker did not get her her check in time. And now I'm sitting here unwanted by anybody with my belongings in a trash bag. And I looked down at the trash bag and I thought, a trash bag, I feel like trash. I feel like I just got put out on the curb, like trash. And I said, God, this makes no sense. This, this absolutely makes no, if you are who you say you are, and I am trying to believe that you are who you say you are, why do you keep doing this to me? I had no, I'm a kid, I had no hand in this. So why am I the one suffering? And as I'm sitting there talking to him, he said to me, he said, if, as long as you keep trusting me, keep honing in on that voice of yours, I am going to use you. I am always here with you. I've never left you, but you have to trust me. Let me use you. And I thought, let me, <laughs> let you use me. Let you use me how? Because how you've been using me is as their punching bag. Nobody has loved me the way that they say that you love us. This makes no sense to me. And I remember just crying, crying, crying. I don't want to live. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to continue on with this. Why am I having to suffer so much? That was always the question. Why am I having to suffer so much? My social worker did come to work. Um, she had me in her office apologizing for what happened to me trying to call around to find a new foster placement. And lucky for me, or it wasn't luck, it was God ordained. The foster family that I ended up with, um, the foster mother had to come to DHS that morning to take care of some paperwork. And while she was there, my social worker looked at her and then did a double take and was like, wait a minute, you have room. Would you be willing to take her? And my, my new foster mother looked at me and was just like, mm, I don't mind. I don't care. We got room. And she asked a couple of questions about me to make sure that I would be a good fit for the family. And she agreed to take me in. And that meant that I was only discarded for a couple of hours because they did take me into their family. And that was my final foster placement in Mississippi. And God is who he says he is, because it was in that foster home where so much began to happen for me. Um, while the foster placement ended up not being ideal for me in the end, it is where my voice began to come alive more so than ever before. 
because I had always been quietly vocal about things, which is why I, I would get in trouble at school because I was always talking. But one of my foster workers realized there was something different about this one. She's not a troublemaker. She doesn't give us any problems. She does what she's supposed to do. She gets good grades and she's vocal. I didn't know that the Kellogg Foundation here in Battle Creek, Michigan, had already been willing to provide money in the state of Mississippi for foster children to begin to share their stories. So my social worker came to me one day and she said, there is this team that is forming. It's called the Sun Team or the Speak Up Now Team. And I think that you would be brilliant for this team. We need you and other foster teams to begin to share their stories to help us make change in Mississippi in the foster care system. And I thought, yeah, I'll do it. You mean I can go and complain and tell the truth about what is happening to me and it will be welcomed because the foster care system is not perfect. And I've recognized a lot of things that need to be corrected. And she said, yes, we want you to do exactly that. Hone in on that voice and use your voice to help us help you guys. And so I did that. I joined the Speak Up Now team and it consisted of about 14 or 15 foster teens across the state of Mississippi. We would meet regularly. We had CASA workers working with us and we would share stories and we would um, share our grievances and our complaints. And then we would work on solutions for those grievances and complaints because there's no, no point in complaining if all you're going to do is complain. We had to come out with healthy resolution. But in hearing their stories, so many foster, so many stories of other foster children, their stories humbled me. Because while I was living in pure hell, or so I thought, I don't think that I would have ever survived the stories that I was hearing. These kids were living in literal hell, whether it was a foster placement or a group home or whatever it was. These kids had been sexually molested, I mean, you name it, uh, physically abused by foster parents, by, you know, DHS workers, by, you name it. These kids had been through hell and they were stuck in a system that was not seeing or hearing them. And so I would go to these group sessions with them and I found that I would listen more than I would talk because my story doesn't compare to theirs. I just want to figure out how I can help make, them, make life better for them at this point. I'm in a decent foster home. I'm not being physically abused. I'm not being sexually abused. My social workers are pretty decent. How can I help them? And we ended up bonding over our mutual experiences and what we ended up accomplishing at, 40, at almost 42 years old, I still take pride in because I wake up every day knowing that I had a part in passing the termination of parental rights bill in Mississippi back in 1995. We spoke across the state of Michigan, or across the state of Mississippi nonstop about the woes of the foster care system. And one issue that rang out loudly was there are so many, there were so many foster children in Mississippi who had been in foster care since birth or very early on. But they were all unadoptable. And they were unadoptable because the state of Mississippi had never terminated their parental rights. And we're talking about parents who show no interest in their children, parents who didn't want their children, could not get their children. So why do they still have legal rights to these children? And those legal rights are blocking adoptions. So that was our main fight. Our main fight was to get the termination of parental rights bill passed. And we managed to do that. The Speak Up Now team had, had a hand in forcing that law to be changed. So now, as of 1995, no other foster child will age out of the system in Mississippi unadoptable. Now they can terminate those parental rights within a reasonable time and those children can be adopted and so they don't have to live under the stigma of just being a foster kid. And in that experience, looking back on it, that was God showing me, I intend to use you and you are going to be attacked at every level because that voice, people are going to want to shut you up your entire life. And I thought, wow, it's un as unhealthy as I think that my life is, as um, imperfect as it is, there is some good beginning to come out of my life. And shortly after joining the Speak Up Now team, my birth mother came back into the picture and she apologized to me for everything that she had ever done to me. And she was sincere in her apology, but I didn't want to hear it. I hated her. I hated the sight of her. She disgusted me. I could not understand why she would allow something that came from her, her own child, to endure the hell that she had allowed me to go through and that she had put me through. And I refused to forgive her. I remember telling God, I am never going to forgive her. 
I want nothing to do with her. As long as I live on this earth, I never, ever want to have anything to do with her. And God, knowing me, he knew that it wasn't an emotional rant. He knew that I was serious. He knew that I was indeed hell bent on never forgiving her. So much so that he came to me in a vision that night. And he came to me in a vision and he didn't say anything. And I couldn't see his face, but I knew that it was him because I could feel his essence. And all I could see was white. And I remember his spirit dragging me, or not dragging me, but coaxing me out of my bed and taking me into this house. And as we entered into the house, I began to recognize, why are we in St. Louis? Because even though I was young when we lived in St. Louis with my, who I thought was my grandparents, was my biological father and his wife, I knew that that was that house because the trauma that I experienced in that home, the images will never leave me. So in this vision, we're entering into this house and I'm trying to understand why is God taking me into this house? And then he begins to lead me down a flight of stairs into the basement. And I'm thinking, why? Well, what is going on here? But he never says anything. He's just guiding me. And then he stops. And because he stops in this vision, I stop. And I, again, I can't see anything. All I see is white. And I'm assuming that it's his garment or it's his spirit or it's essence or whatever. But I couldn't see in the basement beyond that light. But I began to hear. And what I began to hear was a violent assault. And I could hear my mother crying. But it wasn't the voice that I was accustomed to. It was a voice that sounded more like my voice, which meant it was a young version of my mother. And once I realized what was happening, I began to cry profusely and I just begged him, please take me out of here, please take me out of here. I don't want to hear this anymore. So he took me out of there and he led me back to my bed. But before he left me, he said to me, he said, every time you refuse to forgive your mother, it's not the mother that you see. You're refusing to forgive that 13 year old little girl. But that was the night. That was the night that I thought, how dare I? All the hell that she has put me through, I've never been through that hell. I don't want to ever be the cause of adding to that kind of pain and that kind of torture. She has put me through hell, but she has been put through a worse hell. And so from that moment on, I forgave her and I was able to earnestly forgive her. And so at that age, I forgave her. I had found my voice, but I was still in foster care. And so I remember telling my social worker, even though she has not listened, please call my grandmother. And I remember calling my grandmother saying to her, I need you to come and get me. If you don't come and get me, they're going to put me in a group home. If they put me in a group home, I'm going to run away. And you guys are never going to hear from me or see me again because I am not going into a group home. I said, my junior year of high school is almost over. I've got one year left after that. When I turn 18, I'll go, I'll go on my own. You won't have to worry about me, but I cannot go into a group home. I was very happy the day that my grandparents and my younger aunt came and got me because it meant that I'm about to get back to Michigan. I don't have to go to a group home. I don't want to have another vision similar to one that I had about my mother where my grandmother is concerned. So I have no judgment toward her, no bitterness, no unforgiveness toward her for leaving me here for as long as she left me here before I went into foster care, knowing what was happening to me. I just want to get out of Michigan or out of Mississippi. My grandmother, my grandfather and my aunt came to get me. This is my aunt is my grandmother's youngest child. This is the aunt who is only a day younger than me. So we are literally the same age. I was born April 17th. She was born April 18th. The car ride from Mississippi to Michigan gave me so much clarity. God didn't have to give me a vision because he sat me in the midst of that clarity. The tox toxic nature of my grandmother's relationship with my aunt was clearly evident. And I thought, you let her talk to you like this. This is what you've been dealing with with her. I'd heard snippets by eavesdropping on conversations about how she was behaving here, but I never really knew how bad it was. And 
the car ride home was so toxic that I remember crying again going, how could I have ever been mad at her for not coming to get me? She has been dealing with her own version of hell, with her own kid. She didn't have time for me. And quite frankly, I would not have wanted to live in that toxic environment because it was toxic. The screaming, the yelling, the cussing, but it was in reverse. It wasn't my grandmother screaming, cussing, and yelling out her kids. She was the one being verbally abused. She was the one being emotionally abused. And I thought, I was down there this whole time, angry with her for not coming to get me, thinking that she was supposed to rescue me, not realizing what she was enduring. I just wanted more for my life. And I knew that the only way for me to get more for my life was to fight for it and fight for it I did. I graduated high school and got emancipated shortly thereafter. After emancipation, I moved in with my cousin into our own apartment. And from that point on, I've never lived with another person after that. I never looked back. I was, an, I was a young adult, but I was an adult. I was able to take charge of my life and that is exactly what I did. During the course of that um, year that I was living with my grandparents, I was going to church here with my cousins. I had not never really been to a, a church church as far as I could remember, because when I was in foster care, my foster parents were Catholic. They went to Catholic church. I did not understand Christianity because I did not understand what I call the hypocrisy of Christianity, but I definitely did not understand Catholicism. So my relationship with God was the conversation that I had with him. It wasn't religion. It wasn't based on church service. It was what I knew of him directly. So coming back here, my senior year of high school, attending church with my cousins as a 17 year old young person was my first real experience with organized religion. And it wasn't a healthy one. And it left me again asking God, if these are your people and they worship you, what is wrong with you? Because this isn't the God that my grandmother serves. This is the God who saved my life. This isn't the God that you want me to believe you are. Um, I ended up working for the Lansing Police Department. Or I ended up being hired into going through the hiring process for the Lansing Police Department. And part of that hiring process is them sending you through a psych evaluation. And I remember the psychiatrist called me back after my evaluation and he scheduled another appointment, which was not common. And I thought, why is this man scheduling another appointment with me? But he scheduled it for like four or five months later. And I thought, OK, whatever, I'll just keep on working the job that I'm working and keep building up my repertoire to get me prepared for this this second session. From my first meeting with him to him scheduling the second session and in between the time in between, I reconnected with my daughter's father, who was my classmate from high school. And unbeknownst to me, I ended up getting pregnant with my daughter. And I thought that getting pregnant with my daughter was going to derail my career. And when I went to my second session with the psychologist for the police department, the first question he asked me was, has anything significant changed in your life? And I said to him, the only thing significant in my life that has changed is I'm now pregnant. And his eyes lit up and I didn't understand why. And he said, so you're pregnant? Yes. Are you with the child's father? Mm, sort of, yeah. He's in the military, but yeah, I guess so. I didn't realize that me being pregnant meant that he could now approve me to work for the Lansing Police Department. He later told me that coming from my background with hiring me for the Lansing Police Department with the work that, that is entailed in that, I would not have anything or anybody to come home to to take away my, to take my attention away from what I had been working, the environment that I've been working in. And that would be unhealthy for me. But because I was pregnant, my mindset when I was at home and my attention would be on my child. So therefore it was okay to clear me. So getting pregnant with my daughter allowed me to work for the Lansing Police Department in a way because it gave me the separation that I needed. I didn't realize that I was walking into a shitstorm per se. I went to work for the Lansing Police Department and from day one it was toxic. Day one, it was, the racism, the retaliation was clearly evident across the board. Um, I started connecting with other minority officers who were working there. 
I overheard several minority police officers discussing a lawsuit against the police department for what had been going on to the, with, with them. And I ended up joining them. And we ended up being coined the LPD7 because once we got together and once we started sharing and talking about our mutual experiences with mutual individuals within the police department, we decided to sue the city of Lansing for retaliation, discrimination, everything under the sun that, that they had been doing to us. And the, I remember hearing the lawyer say to me, we're gonna need you to be one of the ones that speak up because you are detailed and you are passionate and articulate about what you have experienced. You're gonna be one of the ones that we can bring out, out, out of the forefront because while your coworkers have great stories and I mean, they, they have the stuff that they're telling us is accurate and it did indeed happen. They're also not absolved of wrongdoing to some degree in other areas, but they, the police department doesn't have anything on you. You are perfectly positioned to be one of the faces of this lawsuit. And that is what ended up happening. I ended up coming out, being one of the faces of the lawsuit and saying to God, here you are again, using my voice in a way that I didn't expect. I remember laying in bed with my daughter one night and something happened to me that I haven't been able to explain until very recently in the last couple of years. But I was laying in bed with my daughter and all of a sudden it felt like a thousand pound weight had landed on my chest. I could not move, I could not speak. I remember trying to get my daughter's attention to wake her up because I thought maybe I'm having a heart attack. Maybe I need to call 911 to go to the hospital. But I could not move or speak to get her attention or to wake her up. When I finally realized that I was not going to be able to do anything but lay there and let whatever was happening to me pass, I heard voice, God's voice again. And I heard him say, do I have your attention? And I'm in excruciating pain and I can't talk out loud. I just say in my head, yes, yes, please take this pain away. Please take this pain away. You have my attention. And he said, are you sure I have your attention? Yes, you have my attention. And he said, Tabernacle of David. I said, what? He said, Tabernacle of David. He said, I want you to go to Tabernacle of David. And I'm, I don't, what in the world is Tabernacle of David? Okay, God, I'll go. And he said, do I have your attention? Again, I said, God, you have my attention. Tabernacle of David. I don't know what it is, but I'm there. I'll figure it out and I'm there. And as soon as he knew that he had my attention and I understood what he was trying to tell me, the weight began to dissipate off of my body. And as soon as it released me, I fell to my knees, talking, crying, praying, and then praying in tongues. And I'd never prayed in tongues before, but I now know that what I was doing was praying in tongues. And I thought, oh my God, what just happened to me? After that pain went away, after I accepted the situation for what it was, and I understood what he was telling me, Two something, three o'clock in the morning, I went to my computer and I typed in Tabernacle of David, 2645 West Holmes Road. That was Mother's Day weekend. My daughter was five, about to turn six. Her birthday was in July. So it was 2005, 2000, it was 2006, or some, somewhere around 2006, 2007. I got her up that Sunday morning and she's like, where are we going, mom? I said, we're going to Tabernacle of David. I don't know what's there, but we're going. Got to church. It was Mother's Day weekend. Pastor Cindy Humes was preaching. And I'm listening to her preach. And I had never heard a man or woman preach the way that this woman was preaching. She wasn't preaching at us. She was preaching to us, but it wasn't just preaching. It was more teaching. And you could feel the love emanating off of her. And it was the kind of love that I had felt coming from God. And I remember crying and just pouring my, crying my eyes out going, I get it now. This is where I'm supposed to be. I've been asking you to guide me. And this is where you're guiding me to. And I know that she's not the pastor of this church. But if this is his sister, this is definitely where I'm supposed to be. And I joined church that Sunday. I didn't wait. I didn't hesitate. I knew that. I wasn't invited here by man. I didn't come in here because I didn't have anything else to do. I came in here because this is where God sent me. 
So there's no need in me spending weeks or months trying to figure out if I'm supposed to be a member here. I'm going to join this church. Clearly, I need to be here. I needed something to do with my time in the daytime because I was getting on my daughter's teacher's nerves by always being up at the school. And so one lady in particular, Verna Smith, I love her dearly. She said, you need to come into the office and at least volunteer, you know, get out of the house, come up to come up to the church and volunteer, you know, fig- figure out what your gifting is and I'll help you figure out what that is and we'll get you placed and we'll get you going. And I thought it's something about her spirit. I don't trust women, but it's something about her spirit. So I took her up on that offer and I began to work for Tabernacle of David and Verna and I shared an office and Verna and I were two peas in a pod. It's, Verna had a daughter my age. I graduated high school with her daughter, but Verna might as well have been her daughter age wise because that's how well she and I got along. I just absolutely loved her. She was one of the first women that I had met that was genuine, didn't want anything from me, just one, just was her sweet self. And I could talk to her and, you know, she would pour into me and I would just glean from her. And I began to my wall began to come down and I thought there must definitely be something about the women in this church because I like this one. Months into my time there, Verna didn't come to work. So I was in the office alone, in my office alone. We shared an office. so I was in there alone and I didn't have her in there. I got an email from my birth mother. And at this at this point in my life, my birth mother and I had been going back and forth. You know, she we would get along and then we wouldn't. She we get along and then she and we wouldn't. She'd say something mean to me because of whatever. I, I, at this point, I know that her triggers would trigger her. And because I was the product of a very traumatic experience in her life, she would unleash on me. And again, once I forgave her after seeing that vision that God led me through, taking that forgiveness back was never an option. But because I was no longer in her vicinity, I didn't have to take her abuse anymore. So whenever she would get disrespectful, whenever she would lash out at me, I would just stop talking to her. And in one of those periods where I had just stopped dealing with her and hadn't dealt with her for probably over a year at this point, she sent me an email. And in that email, she broke me. I mean, she had said some pretty nasty, disgusting things to me before, but what she said to me in that email was worse than any of the beatings that she had ever bestowed upon me. And it broke me to a place that I didn't, I've never had, I had never been broken before. Even with so much positivity in my life at the time, and even with the relationship that I was forming at the time, being rejected by her yet again, and having her reject me in the way in which she did, took me all the way back to not wanting to be here. I literally was planning my suicide. I was trying to figure out a way to write a note to my cousin to have her take care of my daughter, while also trying to figure out a safe way to commit suicide without hurting anybody else. And I decided that I was gonna drive down Waverly Road and drive off that bridge. And I ended up sending Desiree a text or an email or something telling her that I was gonna leave. I, I wasn't feeling well. And she called me into her office and she said, why are you leaving? I said, I, I don't feel well, I just need to go home. And it must have been the grace of God because she was on the phone when she was talking to me and she got off the phone because she knew that something was off. She stopped me from committing suicide that day. I was definitely about to go and get my affairs in order with my daughter and drive off that bridge because my mother had hurt me that deeply. And after pouring out my heart to her, and it was something that I'd never done with a stranger, only, I'd only talked to my cousins, but I told her everything that I had been dealing with and I shared portions of the email with her and just told her, you know, this is, I can't do this. Nobody wants me. This makes no sense to me why I'm, uh, I'm this unlovable. I didn't commit suicide, she kept me there. She ended up praying with me and taking me under her wing. And that night though, that night, God gave me a poem and it's entitled A Letter to My Mother. And after I finished penning the poem, I read it out loud. And when I read it out loud, something broke. And it was like, wow, she no longer has permission to do this to me, to get me to a point of me wanting to end my life. And then I had a moment with my birth mother again. She came back into my life. I now know that she came back into my life because of the money. 
she knew that I was getting a settlement, but this was my birth mother. And as much as she had done to me, as much as she had put me through, I wanted to have a relationship with her because of everything that she had been through. I knew that her own issues were why she would act the way that she acted. And so I thought, if she's coming back into my life, I can do this for her, I can do that for her. I've got these siblings that she's struggling to take care of. I can actually help her, you know. I can show her through action that I don't blame her for anything that she ever did to me. And we can actually form a relationship because even though I'm gaining these relationships with women at church, there is nothing like the bond between a mother and a daughter. And I truly want to have a relationship with my mother. I look exactly like this woman. I want to have a relationship with her. I came from her. So I got the settlement from the police department and splurged on my family. I splurged on my mother. I splurged on my siblings. Anything that she needed or wanted, I paid for. One day, probably six months after I received the settlement, I told her no. And like a light flip, she flipped the light emotionally, symbolically, and she reverted back instantly to the toxic abuse of nature that I had grown accustomed to, and I had to completely cut her off. Thank God that I was in a place emotionally where she no longer had the power to lead me to suicide. But I knew then that, one, money, and it seemed like money had been a constant in my life. Everybody was always using me for money. My mother wanted me to take the blood test to prove my paternity because of money. My foster mother got rid of me because of money. Now my mother is hating me all over again because I won't give her any more money. I don't understand this, but whatever, it is what it is. This situation is toxic. I'm not dealing with it. She doesn't have the power to control me anymore. Does it hurt? Yes, it absolutely hurts. But God has given me what I need to survive those verbal attacks. Because I had so much time on my hands during this time in my life, I began to just write, write, not just poems, but I just began to just write about my experiences with so many different things that I've gone through. And I began to um, inquire about publishing my stories and publishing my books. And people would tell me that they would help me publish my books and they never would help me. And he finally said to me, he said, stop asking other people to help you do what I have equipped you to do for yourself. Sit down, learn the system and do it yourself. And so I sat down while my daughter would be at school because I wasn't working and I learned how to publish my own book. And I published the first book, the book of poems, and I published another book and another book and another book. And then I realized this, is, this can be expensive for people who don't know what they're doing. And I've got people coming to me now because I keep publishing books, asking about my services. This is a business. So I legitimized my publishing company and I actually started helping other people publish their books. And I thought, this is a way for me to make money, even though it's not enough money right now for me to support my, myself and my daughter, this is just a glimpse into what my reality, my, my reality can look like if I stop focusing on so many external factors in my life and focus on what God has for me to do. And I thought, okay, I can do this. If you want me to become an entrepreneur, I can see that now. You want me to hone in on the skills that you gave me, I can see that now. I opened up the publishing company, and then I realized there is a term for what people come to you for. You are essentially a virtual assistant. So I became a virtual assistant. I added that to my repertoire. I remember releasing one of my poems, especially a letter to my mother was one of them on Facebook and having a stranger in a completely different city inbox me and say, by you releasing that poem, you have now helped me forgive my own mother. You now have, ne you have verbalized what I have un been unable to verbalize for so long and I can now forgive her. And I remember crying, reading her response going, I have spent so much of my life, what was me, what was me, God, why me, God, why me? And you have told me my entire life, as long as I've been able to hear you, that you had every intention on using me and using my voice. If you using my voice in this simple way has helped free even this one woman from her own life of misery, from feeling even half of what I've been feeling, a simple poem that you released through me has helped release her. I want to continue to, to be that for you. I want to continue to be your vessel. 
I don't want to spend the rest of my life crying about what was me, why me, why me. I want to just trust that as difficult as it is to never fit in anywhere, as difficult as it is to always be on the outside looking in, that I've always been on the inside with you and you've always had a plan for me. And if it is your will for me to use my voice, helping to free other women who are hurting and even young men and women, young men, young men, that is what I want to do. On paper, my life is hell. And I get asked all the time, how are you still standing? How are you still saying? Because even in the midst of it all, God was always there. He never allowed anything to happen to me that I could not recover from. I don't know that I could have, I don't know, clearly I could not. I don't know, but I could not recover from being raped by my own father. My mother lives with that hell every single day. So how dare I punish her for, her tr for how she's triggered when she sees the product of that? You know, how dare I get mad at my grandmother for not coming to get me when she has her own issues and you know, she, their own generational crap. What I can do is stop pointing the finger at other people for what I feel like they didn't do and point it inward and say, but what am I supposed to deal with, do with it? If God led me to it, he also led me through it because I'm still here. And because he's led me through it, as hard as stuff still is to me, to, even to this day, there is a purpose in it. And if I ask myself instead of why me, why me, I ask myself, what are you supposed to do with it now? Who are you supposed to help heal? Get up and go do that because you do have a purpose in life. Your purpose is to be his vessel in any capacity, in any room that he puts you in. There was a purpose in the exile. I found my purpose in the exile. And now that I found my purpose in the exile, he's bringing me out and he set me free. And now I am at the other end of that. And because I am now at the other end of that, and this is not a what was me story. This is not a, oh, I feel bad for her story. This is a story of triumph. And because I am now in this place, I have figured out who I am in God. And I have figured out who I'm supposed to be. And even though there's more to this story, I know enough of who I am now and who I've called to be to live every day with purpose, on purpose, and to appreciate the protection that came across as rejection or exile or me being unwanted. I understand all of that now. And in that, all I want to do is to make sure that other people who are still in the midst of their own darkness or they're still in their own version of exile to understand there is purpose in it all. Don't get distracted by the pain. Don't get distracted by those things that seek to keep you bound. Understand that if God is allowing you to go through it, he is also giving you what you need to grow through it and to become who he called you to be. The exile didn't kill me. The exile forced me to become exactly who I was called to be by relying on God and God alone. There was true beauty in my exile.